the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this other opportunity, once again, Lord, just to wake up, to come celebrate your day in your house, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that today be a day, Lord, where we feel your presence, that you are with us. Lord, I ask that you give us messages today, Lord, messages of repentance, revival, Lord, of action on our part. I ask, Lord, that you wrestle with hearts right now, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy, that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. I ask that your spirit just fill this room, and that every single one of us, Lord, takes away an actionable item that we can apply, Lord, because we don't want to just come meet you here on Sundays, Lord, but we want to meet you every day, Lord, not just in this house, but even in our own house, in our own houses, Lord, where your spirit and your presence just radiates everywhere that we go. And I ask the session of all your saints from our tears, tears we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, so, ironically, while I was um, going downstairs and getting the buttercup from Abuna, Abuna asked me, Hey, are you guys still in the parable series? I said, Yes, we're still in the parable series. And he was just like, You know, how are you enjoying it? So um, I gave him my answer, but I guess my question for you guys is How do you guys feel about this parable? I mean, uh, about the parable series? Likes, dislikes. <laughs> so if you hate it, now's the time to say it. We can totally pull an audible and, and change it by next week, right? Um, but I will tell you one of the things that, uh, that I told him. I said, actually, I'm really enjoying it because we know that the Bible is chock full of parables and Christ taught a lot using parables. And, um, and that part's like really cool, but I feel like a couple takeaways that I had kind of preparing this. First of all, we, we cover very few of them like actually like in our Sunday Gospels. So there's all of these parables that we probably read once over, like the one we're going to talk about today, where it's not super long, it's not super, like you don't hear it a lot, but at the same time, it's like super meaningful. Um, and the way that Christ used these parables and the situations when he needed to use it to get his kind of point across is one of those things where I'm kind of having these aha moments, especially with the parables too, they're like onions, right? So like you peel back the layers. So you'll read a parable, you're like, yeah, I totally know what that's about. And then um, when you start reading a little bit more, right, you'll go to the commentaries, you'll see the fathers, you'll see, you know, all of this other stuff. You're like, wow, there was so much more there that I never, ever even expected. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And today we're going to read the parable of the two sons. So probably not one of the most popular parables, um, not, not, definitely not one of the longest parables, but it's found in Matthew 21. And this is one of those things where I say, you know, when we spend a little bit of time on it, it, it brings a lot of context to it, right? It brings like a deeper level of understanding to the parable. Because before you can dive into the parable, we've got to kind of set the stage a little bit for the parable. Because when you just read the parable, you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. But if you read the chapter, it's a big event chapter. There's like a lot going on in Matthew 21. And I think that if you don't understand the context in which Christ is teaching this, you miss it. Like, you totally, totally miss it. So, if you know Matthew 21, it starts off with a triumphant entry. So, we all know that. That's a big, you know, Coptic Orthodox Day, you know, Palm Sunday. We see that Christ for the first time, really kind of ever. Everyone's chanting. Everyone's praising. It's a big deal, right? And this is, a, this is praise that's been well-deserved since, like, day one. And it's finally coming to the surface, Okay. We know after that, he goes in there and he cleanses the temple, right? And he does it in rather a very straightforward and blunt manner, right? And who was, who was rather offended by that? Yeah, the chief priests, the scribes, they did not take it well at all, okay? And then right, event, right after that, you have the, the cursing of the fig tree, right? And we all know that we have this fig tree that from a ways away, it looks healthy, it's got leaves, you would expect there to be fruit. Christ walks up, there's no fruit, and what's he do? Curses the fig tree, right? Fig tree, I was having a bad day, right? Like I would say that even the fig tree, innocent bystander, because we had all of the pent up frustration <laughs> from like the temple and, and everything else because we knew that the scribes and the chief priests and you know, they were very much that fig tree, right? From the outside, they looked great, no fruit, okay? So you can imagine that you know, it's not Christ right now. There's only one thing kind of on his mind, right? He knows the week he's living. He knows what he keeps running into. Um, in verse 23 of their chapter, you know, they question him. They said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? 
And the beautiful thing about Christ is whenever you ask Christ a question, what can you expect to get back? Another question, right? <laughs> because <laughs> it reminds me, like, like last week we were talking about Job, right? When Job questioned God and God came back and answered Job with a question, you know, where were you when I this and that and this and that? So he comes back with another question. And he says, what bapt um, was a baptism of John from heaven or from men? Right? He, you know, they thought they were putting him in a corner. He reversed it on them. He put them in a corner and they were trapped because they didn't know. If you say from heaven, well, then why didn't you believe what, you know, John said about me? And if you say it's not from heaven, then he's going to really upset a lot of the people because they all loved, you know, John. So what was their response to them? They said, well, you know, um, we don't know. And Christ says, well, if you don't know, then I'm not going to tell you either. So I want you guys to pick up, like, can you guys feel the spiritual tension that's going on right now between, like, the Pharisees, the scribes, and, like, Christ? So you got all of this tension, right? So now the stage is set. And I will read you the parable that we're covering. It's in Matthew 21, 28 through 32. Okay? But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go, work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it and went. Then he went to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the father's will? And they said to him the first. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and harlots enter into the kingdom of God before you. Is that tough? That's, that's a zinger, right? Like, that's, that's very, very straightforward. Um, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believed him. Wow. Like, you think of, like, all of that tension, and then Christ basically goes and he tells them that story. And I will tell you, uh, <clears throat> although this is not a marriage talk, I will give you a little bit of advice that will help you navigate your marriage. How do you think they felt hearing that from Christ? And, and as if that wasn't bad enough, right? Like, so you go, you, Christ kind of just like, just kind of gave it to him, like just how it was. The next parable, okay, if you, if you flip open to the next verse, starting in 33, he tells him about the parable of the wicked vine dress, uh, the wicked vine dressers. And we all know what happens in that parable, right? So you have the owner of the vineyard, leases it out, starts sending people, and they start beating him up, beating him up, beating him up. Son, kill him, right? So you can, like, just, just imagine. And at that point was the first time that they said at, um, that they decided to kill him. At that point, the Pharisees and scribes, they decided, like, dude, enough's enough. Right, like that was like the boiling point. They said it's done, and it said that they, the only reason they hesitated was they feared when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Right? And here's, here, here's my piece of advice, okay? Rule of thumb, if you have a valid concern about not doing something stupid, Satan will find a way for you, okay? Because they had a valid concern. There's things, well, we can't kill him, because the people will uprise, right? So it's, it's okay, we can't kill them because you know, it's, you know, socially it's gonna, it's gonna create a bad situation, right? But then what did Satan do? He just gave him another solution. He says, no, you should kill him, right? But just do it at night. Do it at night so you don't have to deal with the uproar, right? And, what, and guess what happened, right? So they believed it and they did something stupid anyways. So my thing is, you know, when we are in points of conflict, we've got to be very, very careful, right? We've got to be very careful about how we proceed. We've got to be careful. We can't listen to our emotion. This was 100% emotion coming from, like, the Pharisees and the scribes. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm not even in the talk yet. This is all, like, my precursor. But, like, you've got to be very, very careful because in our marriages, we have tense moments, right? That you can defuse tense moments, but at the same time, you have an option because who's going to be giving you bad advice in the moment? Mm -hmm. Satan, every single time. 
right? And even though they had good reason, right? They had good reasoning. They said, we, we, we shouldn't do this right now, right? And instead of diffusing the situation, getting like, getting, getting, like in, in a good place, they just took the sucker's bet and they went and they did something horrific anyways, right? So the, the meaning in this parable is somewhat clear, right? There's two sons in respect and, and back then, um, you know, it's the, the church fathers liken it to the Gentiles and the Jews, okay? And the first group is the Gentiles, okay? They did not obey, right? Didn't obey. It wasn't, it just wasn't their thing. They just, they, they were not listening to the law of God. And like we talked about that, I think we talked about this last week when we were talking about the, the workers of the different hours. And the church fathers basically said, well, they were standing around idle and when questioned, they said, well, nobody told us. Right? So when we look at the Gentiles, we can't just be like, oh, well, they were disobedient, because at the same time, we just, maybe nobody told them. Right? And if you look at it from a believer, non-believer, Christian, non-Christian, right? All of the non-Christians out there, why are they not listening to God's law? Maybe nobody told them. Whose job is that? Our job. We be living our life, we should be living our life in a way where we should be the light in the darkness. We should be the ones that are telling them. Right? But they were not taught God's law the way that the Jews were. And once they heard the law, they were obedient, and their obedience was proven by their works. Because that's what it comes down to, right? Like, what's, what's the, story, the moral of the story here? One of the sons did what he was supposed to do. Not thought about it, not prayed about it, not said, I'm going to go talk to my confession father about doing the right thing. No, he actually got up and went and did the right thing, okay? Then the next group, the Jews. Well, we all know what the situation was here. Right? Because the Jews were supposed to be the obedient people. They were supposed to be the ones that were fully embracing God's law. They were supposed to be the ones that were, you know, you tell me what to do, I'm going to go do it. Beautiful verse, Exodus 19.8. And then all of the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So keep in mind, that was Exodus 19. Their words said, all that God tells us to do, we will do. Exodus 19, okay? Now, if you know your Bible, Exodus 32, 13 chapters later, what happens? Everyone's dancing naked in front of a golden calf they made, right? So it's very easy to say one thing, but when it comes to our actions, we're getting something completely different, completely different, right? In Christ here, it's a foreshadow because what he's basically telling them is that there will be many Gentiles that will convert and will become even more obedient to God's law than you are. And who's he telling this to? He's telling it to the priest, uh, chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, all the religious, uh, religious elites. And we might think about that this is purely a Jew-Gentile thing, right? And it could have been 2,000 years ago. But now, you look at it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's grown in meaning. It's much, much more these days, right? Because when I, when I read this parable, and I go back and I read the commentaries on it, this parable doesn't, it's not just the, the Gentiles and the Jews 2,000 years ago. It is directly applicable to everybody in this house. Everybody in the church. It's directly applicable. This is for everyone who comes to know God's will and pursues righteousness. Because today's message for the church today is not about Jew versus Gentile. It's about believing and being righteous versus not. Because I think a lot of the times, and we have a very rich church, we have a beautiful church, we have a church that gives us a lot of tools, all of these things. It's beautiful, the sacraments, we need to walk through them daily. All of that is great. But I'm going to tell you, if showing up here, just showing up, Okay? If you think that just attending a liturgy, if you think that just partaking of the Holy Communion and it not affecting any other aspects of your life, if you think that that is enough for you to be just before God, you missed it. 100% you missed it. See, because becoming a member of the church will not, purely just becoming, showing up, will not even get you anywhere close to being how righteous we need to be before God. It's not enough. It's not enough. And the message of this parable is so much more, 
right? The message of this parable, when you look at the exact wording it, it's who's putting in the work? Literally, like who's putting in the work? Who is doing what was asked of them to do? He does not ask anywhere in this parable who's in the vineyard. It doesn't show up. Matter of fact, being in the, in the vineyard got you nothing. The question was, you know, and, and I want you to look at the question that was asked, right? The question at hand, if it was just being in the vineyard, then you know what? Then we're all winners. We're all here. We can take the rest of the day off. We can go do whatever we want to do afterwards. If our mere location of showing up was enough, then we're good. But ironically, when you look at the exact question that was asked, uh, actually, I have it underlined here. It says, go work today in my vineyard. Wasn't about presence, wasn't about location, wasn't about anything else. It was about, I need you to go to work. And it wasn't a question, it was a command. He wasn't seeing who was willing. He was seeing who was obedient. <clears throat> So the very, very specific message that you see throughout all of the Gospels, right? And every single thing we should be reading, we should be wondering, like, how does this apply to me? The Word of God written in this book is for life change. So if you're reading your Bible like it's a textbook, if you're reading it like it's an historical account, great, good for you. We need to be reading it because this is God's purpose for life change for us. And we have to take these messages, figure out how to apply them in our life, figure out where we're at in this story. In this story, it's very, very clear where we should be at. It's very, very clear about what Christ is calling us to. He wants us to work in his vineyard. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Someone who is just, you know, really enjoying Christ's teaching yells out to him, blessed is your, is your mother's womb, who bore you and your breasts which nursed you. And that is 110% true. Without a doubt, and you know how we love St. Mary. And Christ's response, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. We've heard that verse a thousand times, right? We've actually even heard people use that verse and they say, if Christ wanted us to exalt St. Mary, he would have done it right then and there, right? He would have like confirmed that. And he would have said, yes, you are right. My mother is so blessed, right? But that wasn't his response. But I don't believe that that's the case at all. Actually, quite the opposite. I think that he was talking about St. Mary in his response. Like, you, you guys think you're calling her blessed because of her womb and because she nursed me? She is blessed. He didn't, he didn't disagree with that. But he said, even more blessed is she because she did not rest in her role. She did not rest in her title. She did not rest in her contribution. There was something about St. Mary that was different than any of that. You know, we have a fast where we, where we fast to intercede through St. Mary. And churches do revivals at this time, right? And they bring speakers to come and talk about St. Mary and the life that she lived and the way that she was such a beautiful example in so many things. And I will tell you, in all of the talks that I've ever attended about St. Mary, none of them brought up that it was her womb. None of them brought up the fact that it was the way that she nursed him. But what did they talk about? They talked about her virtue, the way that she lived her life, all of these great characteristics that she possessed, these great characteristics that, think about it, for all of those years, Christ you know, in heaven, before the incarnation, looking down, waiting for the worthy vessel and seeing St. Mary and being, that's it. That's it. That's, that's who I'm going to use. That is the vessel that is worthy to carry me. And if you think that that had something to do with just a womb and nursing, then we miss it. And I'm telling you, if St. Mary herself did not rest on that virtue or rest on the fact that she bore him and she still had work to do, she still had a response in all of that, then where do we fall? Where do we fall? <clears throat> it, it was her, her virtues, what she did, how she lived, that is what made her blessed. 
John 14 is another place where it's confirmed, and it's about keeping the commandments, that we should not only be doers of the word of God, right? 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words. Is it clear yet what Christ is looking for? Is it clear? Does he want you just to show up on Sunday? Does he want you to come and just, you know, kind of run through the routine, which I'll be honest with you, we're a very rich church and we've got a lot of routine. And a lot of us, we kind of show up on that routine and the routine sometimes can even be tiring. And what do we do? We pat ourselves on the back, like, look how great my routine is. But God's saying, if that's, if that's it, then you're missing it. You know, because being a Christian is not a profession. You know, it's, it's not an intellectual acceptance. Everywhere you look in this Bible, our Christianity is a mere act of repentance. There has to be repentance. After repentance comes conversion. After conversion comes a, a living a life according to God's word. You can't, you can't get away with that. And what I love about this and what I love about in this parable too, because you see so many times in this parable, he's addressing something, right? And at this point, he's, he's addressing the hypocrisy that we are seeing in like the, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, all these religious rulers, right? Like he's just addressing all of that. But he still has a heart for the lost. And in this, in this parable, he's checking them, right? Those who have, but then he also tags on there, those who have rejected Christ are not without hope, right? Even the first person in the story rejected the father, but offered a repentance, and that's who was exalted in the story. He's the one that Christ says, yes, he did something horrible. He did something bad. You know, he rejected it. But when he came back, he says he did the will of the father. He did the will of the Father was not tied to whatever was going on in the rejection part. And I love the fact that he brings that up. You know, because our church's history gives us plenty of examples who rejected the love of Christ, who turned their back on the love of Christ, who were living in a way that were so far outside of the vineyard, it wasn't even funny. And we, many of them that we thought that there's no way that these people can ever come back. These guys are outside of grace, you know. But not only were they converted, but they became more righteous than those who were living in the church. Many of them spent their whole entire lives in church, right? But when you compare them to the repentant sinner who was far, the repentant sinner is the one who achieved sainthood. A couple weeks ago, Abuna Daniel brought up the example of St. Mary, St. Mary of Egypt, who was a harlot, who lived in deep bondage of her sin. And she's the one that we are exalting. Many of, I guarantee you, more than how many people who lived in her time period, even during her own life, who might have grown up in the church, showed up every Sunday and did all of this other stuff, but they couldn't even step up close to her righteousness after she offered a sincere repentance. And we have people who have been in the church for years, maybe their entire lives, but still haven't tasted a sweet repentance yet still haven't offered the sort of repentance that Christ himself is looking for. And honestly, we have people in the church running through our little spiritual routine that we're really good at, who our lives look no different than anybody outside of the church. We do a great job at showing up on Sunday. But Monday through Saturday, you would never, ever think anything different. Remember, the other son was in the vineyard, right? He made promises. He told his father, yeah, I will go and I will do that for you. But his actions never matched his words. And that's a huge disconnect. And I think that is where all of us can relate a little bit in this story. Because I think how many times have we all made empty promises? How many times have we said, God, if you do this, I'm going to do this? Like, we've all done that before. Right? And then guess what happens? God is faithful. And we are faithless. And there's huge disconnect about what we say and what we do. But it's much better to be the son who rejected the father's instruction, but then repented and worked for him. And my prayer is that that's where we all end up. Because I know that we've all rejected the father at one time or another. We've all received very clear instructions on what he wants us to do, 
how he wants us to work and what area of the vineyard that he even wants to use us. And we've even told him okay, but we've done nothing. And that's where our repentance needs to come in. And then Christ told the chief priests and the elders and the tax collectors and the harlots. He, he basically told them that, guys, you guys might be the scribes, you guys might be the chief, like, I know that you guys consider yourselves like you guys are the spiritually elite. Like, you think like that's where you're at. But I, I tell you, that the tax collectors and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. Imagine that. You want to know why they wanted to kill him? Imagine that, right? And he chose two very extreme examples, right? So we know the tax collectors, right? The tax collectors, they were all about greed and love of money. So he takes that example. So you see all of those people that you hate because they are robbing the brethren, right? Because these tax collectors are like Jews who are like working with the Romans, right? And they basically turn on their own people to basically steal their stuff from them. He says, you know those guys, the guys that you really, really hate, the guys that are doing it because they love money and they're so greedy? Yeah, they're going to go to heaven before you, okay? He says, oh yeah, not just them. You know the harlots, right? The harlots, the prostitutes, the ones who gave themselves away to lust and cardinal pleasures, you know, the, like the, the bottom of the bottom, like, like we're talking like the worst ones ever. Yeah, they're going to get to heaven before you. And he's saying this to, to the religious leaders at the time. And this, is what I, and this is what I love about Christ, because even though he was given this stiff message to the church leaders, he was still making sure that it was, it was fragments of grace for the sinners. If you don't think that that, that, that word made it to the sinners, made it to the people. You don't think that there's a, a tax collector who when they were hearing the way that Christ checked these guys, he says, wait, he said, I can make it before them? The harlot saying, wait, wait, he said, he said that about me? I can make it before them? Because at, at this time, those people, the tax collectors and the harlots, especially two classes that were without hope, without hope. Like, no one gave them the time of the day. They were excluded, like, from the church, from the temple, and from any hope of salvation. And what God was telling them was that there's no one without hope. Not a single person. You think that's the worst of the worst? The worst of the worst is not without hope. The lowest of the low is not outside his reach. The worst of the worst, repentance can fix that. All of that. And God, in his entire ministry, from the beginning to the end, parables, miracles, anything that you come into contact with, you're reading through the Gospels, beginning and the end, always reminding sinners that he was willing. Every message, I'm willing. If you're willing to offer repentance, I'm willing to, I'm willing to give you salvation. I'm willing to give you forgiveness. I am able. And that message that he was giving 2,000 years ago in the parables is the same message that comes to every single one of us today. He's telling us today that, look, even if you rejected my call earlier, even if you told me you were going to, if you told me no, that's okay. If you told me you were going to do it and you never did it, that's okay too. Right? Like, there's still hope. It's not too late. He wants our obedience because to, to God, that is the most important thing. It's what's central, that we must repent, we must change our ways, and we need to remove all of those barriers between us and God, which are really our sins. Because it's really hard to have an honest conversation with God while we're holding on to all of our sins and we're not really willing to let those go. The letting go of all of that, that is where the repentance comes in. Where we say, you know what, God? I'm willing to let go. I'm willing to give it to you. And that's where we start. See, because every, both sons, in this story, needed repentance. Not one of them was without it. And every single one of us needs a repentance too. The difference is, is each one of our repentance can just look a little bit different. We might need to repent from different things. Our moving forward actions might be a little bit different as well. But I love this quote from St. John Chrysostom. It says, let no one among you live in despair and let no one who lives in virtue slumber. Everyone's got a job to do. If you're, if you're in your sin, don't be without despair. And if you're in virtue, 
Don't be lazy. There's a lot of work to do. That vineyard has a lot of work. And we need to be diligent at how we respond to him when he calls us to it. Does anybody have any questions or comments? All right. So that's two weeks in a row, no questions or comments. So I'm just going to take it like I should probably stop asking. OK, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you give us these great examples, Lord, and your parables ring so much truth. For, Lord, so many times we look at these, and, and we just want to know, okay, what's this mean for me? What's this mean, Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? And if I'm that son who's rejected you, Lord, I ask that you give me the ability just to, to confess that, Lord, to repent, and to come back to your vineyard and just to get to work, Lord. And if I'm that son who's basically told you I'm going to do it, but have no desire to do it, Lord. I ask that you give me a repentance as well, that I can get to work for you, Lord. Because, Lord, what we really know that what, what it comes down to is the relationship between the father and the sons in this story, Lord. The first son felt bad, and his guilt brought him back to get to work. The second son, Lord, he took you for granted. He didn't care. He was probably just enjoying the life at the vineyard. But Lord, there's so much more than that. So Lord, I ask that, that you make this week just even just a little bit different for us, Lord. That you open our eyes to some things, Lord. You're the one that promised us, Lord, that you are the one that, that you laid out the good works before us that we might work, uh, walk through them. So I ask that you just open our eyes to that a little bit this week, Lord. I ask that you encourage us this week, Lord, just to, to give us opportunities, Lord, that we can work in that vineyard. That when you're calling us to work in that vineyard, Lord, that our, our hearts are open to it, Lord. That we catch it, because I feel so many times, Lord, you're speaking to us, but we miss it. And Lord, I ask that you just allow us to spend a little bit more time in your presence, just a little bit each day, Lord, so we can get better at hearing your voice. Because so many times, Lord, the world is loud. And we miss your soft, still voice, Lord. So encourage us all, Lord, just even if it's just five minutes a day, Lord, just to get in your word so we can hear your voice a little bit more. And I ask this in session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.